Um, insulin and diabetes. Obviously, a lot of our patients that we look after are diabetic, uh, and we know um, that we need to be mindful with people that are diabetic because obviously pressure ulcers, they're more at risk. Um, again, nail care needs to be done by a specialist person. Um, and we spoke last week, we did do vital signs last week, didn't we? We did last week about doing blood glucose, et cetera, and normal ranges. Um, so now we're just going to look at raising the awareness around insulin. Um, when I come out to see you, you will be observed administering insulin. Uh, so I will bring my mannequin along. I have to observe you do the glucose and administer the insulin. Um, you need to understand how to uh, perform that, understand the associated risk with uh, insulin administration, and obviously uh, reduce the risk of error or harm to your clients. So uh, in 2010, so this is quite a bit out of date data here, um, there was 15,227 insulin errors. Uh, we're probably roughly at the same now anyway. Um, and six recorded deaths for insulin overdoses. So uh, lots of things that we need to think about. So what can go wrong when you're giving an insulin injection, do you think? Not giving the correct amount. Okay, so overdosing or underdosing. So we're looking at basic medication policy here, aren't we? The six routes, seven hours or 12 hours, whatever your hours are. Yes, yeah, so that's one. What else could happen given an insulin injection? What else could go wrong? Sorry? I think you need to check as well the blood to... Yeah, so if you have checked the gluco levels, you may be given too much and then you're yeah. hyper. Yeah, so that could be another error. Think, think about your needles and sharps. What can go wrong when you're using needles and sharps? Uh, too big, too small, damage the... Yeah, absolutely. You could damage somebody, so you could cause some tissue damage, infection. Uh, so lots of things that can happen um, that goes wrong. So what are the six R's to medication administration? The right patient, the right dose, the right time. The uh, right route. The right route. Um, right. Inside, no? right, right time, you. right medication, right, right person. Good. Good. Mm. Okay, so um, we've got different types of insulin pens here. Have you all seen these insulin pens in your time? Yeah. Not yet. If you haven't, don't worry. When I come out and show you the pens, we'll do it together. But ultimately, the, these are the pens in which you get uh, very typical. They've got the twisty bits at the top and they do a click. So if you're visually impaired, you can count the clicks for the units. Uh, but equally, there's that visual bit. Um, and uh, obviously, all insulin needs to be stored in line with the manufacturer storing, uh, which is normally just at room temperature, uh, cool but not cold. Um, so that's fine. Uh, you shouldn't be drawing up insulin anymore. They should all become in the preloaded pens. Um, you've got different types of insulin. So you've got rapid acting insulin, which works within five to 10 minutes. We've got short acting insulin, which works between 30 and 60 minutes. Um, intermediate between two and four or long acting within six hours. Um, so rapid acting is normally taken just before meals. Um, and again, uh, least like to cause hyperglycemia, so that's the drop in uh, blood sugar. Short acting, injected several times a day. Uh, so that's just about keeping it more regulated. Um, lasts for about two to three hours, uh, um, and then lasts for five to eight. Then you've got your uh, intermediate, which is your longer lifespan and slower starts. Peaks about 10 to 14 hours and lasts up 16 hours. And then obviously you've got your long acting. Where, do you, where did insulin originate from? So where, where do you think insulin 
as a medicine originally came from? Because we've got two types of insulin. We've got a synthetic insulin and real insulin. Where do we country? China. <laughs> America. So, so synthetic insulin is obviously made in a, in a laboratory. Uh, real insulin normally comes from pigs. So the real insulin, um, it was seen as uh, going back 150 years ago. Um, I can't remember the country. I want to say it was China. I want to say it was somewhere over that way. Uh, there was an incident where there was a shortage of insulin um, and this woman decided to see if she could take from a pig. She took it from the pig uh, and actually it became one of the longest lasting uh, insulins there was because it was a light for light. Obviously, we don't recommend you going into animals, taking animal insulin to test these things, but uh, that's where it comes from. So equally, just knowing that gives you a bit of thing around equality and diversity um, and around the right to know what you're injecting into your body. Because did you know that the original insulin comes from an animal? No. So if you are vegetarian or you've got those beliefs, you may find it difficult um, being prescribed uh, an insulin that's got an animal product in it, where obviously there is the option between the two synthetics. Um, that's fine. So different injection sites for dispensing the insulin. Uh, we're looking for nice muscly areas um, in where we can go. So we've got obviously our abdomen area, so we can just squeeze a bit there. We've got our thighs our, and our buttocks. Um, okay. So the reality is when we look for insulin and we're looking for injection sites, we should be rotating those sites. So um, when you give insulin, you should record where it was given, uh, because again, if you keep giving the injection in the same areas, you can cause the skin to harden and the skin to become a bit thicker. Uh, and that becomes a problem because the insulin needles are only subcutaneous. Um, so they're only small needles uh, and that can obviously be a problem. So just knowing that you, you, you're looking for those fleshy uh, areas with, with a fair bit of muscle around them. So in the injection sites, what you want to avoid is obviously having any lymphedemia. So that it's where uh, it's constantly being put in there and obviously you end up with those massive lumps and things. So you want to avoid that. So again, having that rotation is really important because nobody wants additional massive lumps in their body when you could be rotating it around and avoiding um, any of that happening. When we pinch the skin, um, you've got the right way and wrong way. So here we're going subcutaneous and we're just pin pinching it up and we're going in kind of that way up. Um, and again, what we're trying to do, we're trying to lift the skin up to get the tissue underneath and to get those that nice fatty bit of muscle there. But what we're not doing, we're trying to pick the fat up, but we're not picking the muscle up. So if you see in the first one, they're going quite deep on that grab and you're picking the muscle up with that. When you're doing it, you're just getting the fat. And that's because the needle is small and it's sub um, subcutaneous. So it's not intramuscular. If it was intramuscular, it would be a bigger needle and it goes into the muscle. Subcutaneous means it's just going through the tissue into the fat. Yeah, so that's what we're looking for there. Um, so that's the right way of a bridge. Equally, you may be told of a different technique, um, which is the Z track, and that's where you pinch the skin and you do that. So it kind of creates the canal. Uh, the problem is with this bridging is when you bridge up, when you put the needle in at the top, the fluid remains at the top. So when you let go, sometimes fluid comes back out. Yeah, so you just need to be mindful of your techniques. So um, looking then at uh, the right time, obviously making sure you know if it's the short acting insulin, you'll take your insulin with, um, with or straight after your meal. Uh, and if it's not, uh, you may take the insulin average between 30 or 40 minutes before your meal. So again, just knowing when that is. Side effects of insulin, um, people can appear to be 
agitated, sweaty, shaking, grumpy, dizzy, confused. Um, they can have symptoms sometimes of being uh, almost drunken like and, and being quite agitated. But equally, you've, you've got in those pictures there the blotching. So this is obviously all the needle marks and stuff. So that's poor rotation. Yeah, so that would be really uncomfortable for somebody. So what are the most common symptoms for hypoglycemia? And when I mean hypoglycemia, what, what do I mean by that? It's low, low blood sugar. Low blood sugar. So what's the common Drink. symptoms? You're drinking a lot. Yeah. You nausea, um, feeling cold, uh, dizzy. Yeah. So what would be on the glucose machine, what's hypoglycemia on a score? 2.5. So anything below, super five would be, yeah. So anything below four is seen as hypoglycemic. Um, so that, that's, that's grand. Anything hyper is anything above seven. Uh, and again, if you remember what we said last week, uh, let me see if I've got it on here. Um, I don't know actually if it's on this one. Is it? No, it's not on one of these cards. Um, what I would do, oh no, actually in your training, sorry, uh, you've got a grid uh, and it gives you all of the scores. So it goes obviously below four is hypo. Then you've got your seven to like, there's a threshold of 15 where it goes slightly high, 15 to 20 something is considered to be really high 23 and above is considered to be dangerous so again for your glucose there are certain thresholds as those numbers go up that you need to be aware of um so okay so mild hunger palpitation sweating shaking dizziness ta uh, tachycardic uh, tachycardic is what the heart is beating faster very fast, yeah, so it's beating too fast. Yeah, uh, moderate then, confusion, drowsiness, lack of uh, uh, coordination, speech slurring, uh, and aggression. So actually, this is the bit where it starts to look a bit like somebody being drunk. Um, so it's that really strange behavior. And then severe, you're looking at loss of consciousness, uh, interconvulsions, et cetera. So anything less than four MMOL. Uh, you're going to be looking at um, hyperglycemia. Treatment for hyperglycemia then, we're looking at a glucose intake or if you've got those glucose sashes, you're going to put in the gums and whatever. Uh, again, should be a PRN if you've got those glucose, glucogels, um, but we're looking for a sweet, sweet substance to, to bring it up. So what are the common symptoms for hyperglycemia? So high blood sugar. Sweaty. Yeah, sweaty. I think it's the same, still the same, isn't it? You feel a lot of them, yeah, absolutely. It's very hard to tell, same symptoms. The only way you're going to tell is if you do the glucose. Um, so, yeah, so you need to be mindful of that. So, equally, everyone that has um, insulin will have, should have an insulin passport or, or some kind of book where you can track what their normal glucose are. Do any of you dispense insulin at the moment? No, I'm not allowed. They've said to me I'm not allowed. Okay. So obviously part of your assistant practitioner program, you have to learn how to do it. So, so you'll do it when I come out to see you. That's fine. But basically just be mindful that insulin is like, no, it's like a normal, it's a medication at the end of the day. It's a drug. You've got your EMAR chart and it will say give five or give 10 units of insulin. I have seen, I've seen how well they Perfect. do. Perfect. The only time it differs is when somebody's going into a hyperglycemic attack. And what it says there is, it's a PRN. So it will say um, for every unit that they're up, for every unit they're over seven, you normally give another unit of insulin. So for example, if I was 20, and I should be seven, I'm 14 units different. 
So I would have my normal dose plus 14 units more. But it, it works out. There's no rule to it. It's done by the, the doctor. So you must make sure you have read the PRN medication for somebody who's on insulin because you've got your normal administration, your morning and night, and then you need to know what to do in the event of a hyperglycemic problem. So when there's too much, and it will normally say on the MAR chart, give this plus, and then it will say however many units. Okay, be mindful it's different per, per everyone. Okay, so how do we rotate our injection sites? Oh, was... um, yep, so how do we rotate our injection sites? on different areas yeah so we're just gonna just ask where the last place was and we'll record it and say gave it in the left abdomen so now we're going to do it in the right gave it in the left bum cheek now we're going to do it in the right so we we don't cause that hardening of the skin um, and actually it means throughout the day we're not injecting more than once into it to any particular site okay so how do we check blood glucose before we give insulin it's a blood test machine. Yep. So we're going to wipe the cord, clean the finger. Yeah. We're going to go in the corner of the finger, not on the pad, corner of the finger, drop in that machine, and it tells us. And again, I do have to observe you do that when I come out. Uh, there are videos online on how to do that. Okay. So that's insulin. That's fine. Right. Um. 